Welcome to Atheist Talk on KTNF AM 950, the progressive voice of Minnesota. Good morning to all of you joining us locally by radio and streaming online. We appreciate you tuning in. Today is Sunday, November 11th, 2018. My name is Maddie Love. With me in studio is Joseph Homrich. Good morning, Maddie. We are happy to be joined by Camille Berzek. Camille is a writer living in New York City. She lives in, she works in digital media at the Joyful Heart Foundation and runs a blog called Gay Rights. Camille also makes YouTube videos, writes about LGBTQ issues, social justice, and other stuff on the internet that makes conservative snowflakes like Pat Robertson melt. She has studied journalism, marketing, and communication at Northwestern and Johns Hopkins, and is here to talk about her first book, Queer Disbelief, Why LGBTQ Equality is an Atheist Issue. The book is currently available on Amazon, and if you ask her really nicely, bring your own Sharpie, I'm pretty sure she'd be willing to sign your Kindle. This is an open conversation. We welcome and encourage listener interaction with your phone calls to 952-946-6205, your emails to radio at mnatheist.org, tweet us at Atheist Talk, or find us on Facebook over at facebook.com slash Atheist Talk. Joseph and Camille, thank you for taking a New York Minute to join us here in Minnesota. Thank you so much for having me, Maddie. <laughs> So I feel as though I'm seeing, like from my personal experience and then from things like MythCon and whatnot, I feel like I'm seeing a stronger dividing line among atheists between those that think LGBTQIA plus equality is an issue we should be discussing in atheist circles and those who believe atheism should be limited to whether or not zombie sky wizards will grant you wishes if you ask really, really hard. Um, why should atheists care about <laughs> LGBTQ equality? So atheists should care about this because LGBTQ issues and atheist issues overlap in so many ways, especially now in this uh, tumultuous political moment we find ourselves in. And every political or social victory for one group should also be thought of as a victory for the other one, too. So for one thing, when we see LGBTQ people civil rights violated uh, in the U.S. and abroad, most of the time that's rooted in some kind of religious purpose. So that's, you know, a, a church not granting the same rights to LGBTQ people as to others. It's uh, some kind of law saying that people have the right to discriminate based on religious um, based on religious beliefs, and when that happens, it's a really clear violation of the separation of church and state, which is something that generally atheists care really strongly about, and it sends the message to atheists that one religious belief should receive preferential treatment over another. So for atheists, that's a really significant thing, and something that at least many of the atheists I've spoken to say that they care a lot about. But the second reason that I try to dive into is that we have this tendency to define people by just one of their identities, whether that's I'm gay, I'm trans, I'm an atheist, whatever it may be. But the reality is that people hold so many different identities at once. So the research, uh, the most recent research shows that almost half of LGBTQ people are also non-religious. So if atheists don't support LGBTQ rights and people in communities, they're leaving out, they're leaving their own people behind. They're leaving out a huge component of their own community and missing out on some really clear opportunities to work with those folks on other secular issues, too. So basically, this book is about the ways that atheists and LGBTQ people can be natural allies to each other in social movements uh, when they're seeking equality and respect from the law, from their loved ones. Um, and that really includes responding to discrimination and bigotry that are rooted in religious belief. I like everything you just said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad to hear it. <laughs> well, sometimes for me, it seems like it. It's the like my answer to the question is like you know why is, should we care? It's like uh, duh. Like it's such you you phrased it. And, and worded it very much, very, much, much better than than, <laughs> than I could because that's I usually just go with like this is so simple. This is like not even this is a no brainer of of whether or not we should be backing it on the same side. Well, it's funny you say that because so many people that I talked to, so I did dozens of interviews uh, in preparation for this book, and I was expecting people to have thought about it in the same way that I have and come up with like this long drawn out answer. But most people said exactly that duh, it's the right thing to do, why wouldn't we? And, like, you can get, like, intellectual about it if you want to and look at, you know, the historical and social overlaps, which is, of course, what I did for the book purposes. But for most people, the answer is, duh, it's the right thing to do, which I think is actually uh, really comforting and encouraging. Well, and I think for me, too, is based on my background, because I was a formal evangelical fundy, is that like I viewed it specifically as a sin and a terrible thing through the lens of my religion. So when mm -hmm. I left that religion, 
I only was able to see it. Well, maybe not only able to, but that's the, the way I saw it at first when I left the religion was back yeah. to, well, of, the only reason I didn't like it was because of Jesus. So now there's no reason to have a problem. Well, that and being queer myself. but <laughs> <laughs> That's also a big part of it, yeah. So you're... You yeah, I mean, I... Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say that I also uh, like it. That's something that a lot of folks echoed as well. Um, so groups that are uh, really diehard evangelicals or even the sort of performance art Christian groups like the Westboro Baptist Church, um, when they work so hard to to illustrate that clear link between hatred and Christianity, of course people who are not strong Christians to begin, to begin with are going to say, oh, maybe I'm not so interested in that side. Uh, let me go over here to the folks who don't believe in Jesus and also don't believe in hating one another. So it makes perfect sense. Well, yeah. And, and you talk about disparity in your book uh, and the way that marginalization happens and the degree to which it happens between heterosexual white men and LGBTQIA plus or ethnic and racial minorities. Can you talk a bit about the disparity and marginalization and those differences? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I know that there are a lot of folks who have uh, worked on this for many years longer than I have, but I think when it comes to this but this particular issue and this uh, overlap of identities, it's really important to remember that there is no singular monolithic LGBTQ community, no is, nor is there a monolithic atheist community. So even if everyone in this group shares one common trait, whether it's sexual orientation, gender identity, or lack of religious beliefs, what have you, other things like people's race, class, economic background, uh, immigration status, the way that they grew up in the world, that, uh, that informs the experiences that they come to the table with, and it also informs the way they're going to be treated in society based on other things. So even though you know two people might, be, uh, might both agree that they are both atheists, they might have radically different backgrounds that affect the way that others treat them in the world, and that also affect the opportunities that they're going to have in the world. So I'm trying as much as possible to, um, to make the case for atheists to recognize those differences and see that you know not all atheists are the same. We don't all have the same background, and we also face really different uh, realities in terms of how the world perceives us and will treat us. And one of the biggest ways is, um, like you just said, uh, racial backgrounds, uh, LGBT status, and and so many of the other uh, factors that are that are really more prominent than ever right now in this current political climate. Yeah, I mean, I just look at in the trans community. You know, being a white trans woman, a middle class, I have a job, professional, my, the way I see atheism and experience the world is probably a lot different than, say, the way a trans woman of color in Atlanta, Georgia, or outlying suburbs of Atlanta, probably, sees the world. I mean, Absolutely. if nothing else, like, my my average lifespan, or, you know, average, yeah, is, is about normal to what, like, a cis woman says, whereas a trans woman of mm-hmm. color, 35 years old, like... Their 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 worldview, <laughs> the way they see the world and experience the world, is so much different than mine. Exactly, and that's something that I you know that I really reckoned with in writing this. Also, so as a white queer woman, how do I recognize that I am both white and a feminist without being a quote unquote white feminist and doing so many of the exclusionary things um, that sort of come to be associated with with white women in the world? Um, and how to how to really reach out and say that I want to include uh, the significance of of working across racial lines and intersectionality without overstepping and without claiming an experience that is not really mine. So, yeah, I'm I'm really glad you brought that up because I think that's something uh, that certainly some atheist communities are having that conversation, but not all of them. Uh, and I think that we, as a group, need to be more mindful and saying how can we. How can we support those among us who are the most marginalized, who have the most to lose under this administration, but also in general, um, and really recognize, like, yes, I'm queer, yes, I'm an atheist, but I also have so many more privileges than so many people that I share those identities with, and how can I use that uh, for good, not evil? Yeah, I really like how you you know, you know included a lot of different stories in your book from people with different perspectives than yours. Um is that did you seek out stories that like corresponded to what you wanted to say in the book or did like the book coalesce around stories you wanted to tell or was there what was the process with you for that so it started with a really wide outreach to seeing who who wanted to talk to me i basically if somebody wanted to tell me their story i was not going to say no 
But when it came down to selecting what stories would actually appear in the book, it was really important to me to reflect accurately the array of atheist voices and stories that shape this community. So while, you know, the the atheist subreddit might be primarily straight white guys, that's not what the atheist community actually looks like. Um, And it was important to me to show especially, like, the activists who are doing this work uh, because they have intersectional identities and they feel strongly about it. So I, you know, talked to a Black Lives Matter activist from Houston, who talks about being black and an atheist and the other uh, the other identities that that affect his work, or to people who are re- religious progressives and also trans or and also queer? Um, I think it's I think it's more important than ever to recognize that things like that are not a trend. Uh, they're not just something that's cool and coming up right now. That people have people like this and people who have these identities have been around for years and years and years and have been doing this work you know, longer than some of us have been alive. Um, So it was definitely intentional to get as diverse as possible an array of voices and to really show a clear picture of what the atheist community looks like right now. Yeah, it was as a as a white trans woman, like it took me a long time coming out because of the culture I live in to realize, oh, wait, Sylvia Rivera, Marsha P. Johnson, like these people were trans women of color that started the Stonewall, and that white people had nothing to do with it. Like, I mean, it didn't shock me or anything because I'm not, I try not to be racist, but at the same time, it was like, oh, yeah, I need to like, step back from our worldview and, and, and look at the world in a broader sense. But we're going to go into a break. Uh, when we come back, uh, we will talk to Camille. It's Berjik. Berjik? Berjik. Berjik. Dang it. I'm Maddie Love in studio with Joseph Homage. You're listening to AM 950 KTNF, the progressive voice of Minnesota. Welcome back to AM 950 KTNF, the progressive voice of Minnesota. You're tuned into Atheist Talk. I'm your host, Maddie Love, in studio with Joseph Humbridge. And in just a moment, we'll return to Camille Barajek, author of Queer Disbelief, Why LGBTQ Equality is an Atheist Issue. Atheist Talk is produced with funding from the Minnesota Atheist and Cucumbers Restaurant in Edina, Minnesota. Please consider visiting our sponsors, and if you do, let them know that you appreciate their support of Atheist Talk. If you would like to advertise in this program and help keep atheists on the air, please contact us at radio at mnatheist.org. On December 15th, Minnesota Atheists will be hosting its annual Winter Solstice Banquet. Join us for a magical night. This year's Winter Solstice Banquet will be at the Embassy Suites in Brooklyn Center. Our theme highlights the performing art of magicians. The featured entertainment of the featured entertainment will be friend of the show, friend of mine, and two-time Atheist Talk guest, mentalist David Gamut. The price is $55, which includes a butlered meal and an evening of entertainment. The event is open to the public, but membership has its privileges. Members of Minnesota Atheists and Humanists of Minnesota will receive a $5 discount. Head over to mnatheist.org to make your reservations today as reservations close on December 7th. And now we'll get back to Camille, author of Queer Disbelief, available right now on Amazon. If you'd like to get involved in the conversation, you can call us at 952-946-6205. Email us at radio at mnatheist.org or tweet us at Atheist Talk or find us over on the Facebooks. All right, Joseph, you wanted to start out with a few questions that you'd had. I do. Uh, Good morning, Camille, and I want to hear some stories. So for the benefit of our listeners, could you tell us about the evolution of your atheism? Did it go hand in hand with acceptance of your sexuality? Were they completely separate trajectories? Did one influence the other? Sure. Uh, what a great question. So for me personally, uh, my atheism and my identity as a queer woman developed in their own little silos, and it wasn't until I got a little bit older that I realized how, how much they actually had to do with each other. So I talk a little bit about this in the book, about my own religious upbringing. So uh, I grew up, my mom was Catholic and my dad was Jewish, and neither of them really uh, pushed my brother and I to uh, to adapt either of those belief systems. So I like to say that I grew up um, doing two sets of holidays, but had no real beliefs. Um, I did Christmas and Hanukkah, but I didn't really know what either of them meant. And in uh, in middle school, I uh, I became friends with a group of girls who were very Christian, who felt very strongly about their religious beliefs. And I thought, okay, maybe you know, if I want to be cool, then this is what I have to do. I have to become a Christian too. And uh, a friend of mine got me a teen study Bible, which was 
very, very cool at the time um, in my little, my school in Florida. And in trying to basically teach myself how to be a Christian, I found that even at 11 or 12 years old, there was a lot in the margins of this, um, of this cool, like, multicolored Bible that I really didn't agree with. So for one, uh, it spoke really strongly against um, interreligious marriages, like the ones that my parents were in. Um, and I, from the beginning, I recognized, wait a second, maybe God and maybe this Christian world doesn't actually want my parents to be together, doesn't want me to exist as a product of their marriage. I might not be so on board with this uh, after all. And stemming, starting from that, but also in learning more about the different tenets of certain religions, I just realized that I didn't believe that there was a God watching over me or that I had been created in this image. Um, the, the really core um, principles of Christianity and of all religions <laughs> didn't make sense to me and didn't seem to be something that um, that made sense for my life. And at the same time, as, as um, a teenager figuring out that I was queer, and that um, the only conversations I'd heard that were related um, gayness and religion were really negative and were of religious folks speaking uh, really terribly about people who were like me. So it wasn't until I stumbled across uh, my editor, Hemet Mehta's blog, The Friendly Atheist, a couple years later, that I realized, wait a second, there's already groups doing this kind of intersectional work between atheism and LGBTQ communities. Uh, there are other people like me, and it's it's really okay to be both of these things. Um, and then research, and then starting to write for Hemet and eventually uh researching this book, I realized that I was not the only one who saw such a clear relationship between um, between being an atheist and being a queer person. So a lot of the folks that I spoke to said that one identity really did inform the other, um, that once they came out, they realized that religion was no longer a place for them, or that they had never grown up with a religious influence, never needed one, um, and that the idea of, um, of reporting back to a god <laughs> instead of to their own, um, to their own values and principles didn't make sense for them. So, yeah, that was um, that was my little coming-of-age story, and I, I'm really humbled that a lot of people had similar ones, um, and that I'm not alone in this. Huh. Well, I want to say some very nice things about the organization here in Minnesota, in a Minnesota Atheist. You know, I've been a member of Minnesota Atheist for like 30 years or something like that, and mm-hmm. I don't think I've ever been a member of a more pro-gay rights organization. And here in Minnesota, whenever a question of like LGBT rights or, or the law comes up, Minnesota Atheist has always been probably the first to jump to the front and advocate for it. So I was a little bit surprised to hear that there might be um, folks in the atheist community who weren't totally on board with this. Could you tell me about opposition or... Um, similar uh, opinions that you've encountered in the atheist community. Is there a reluctance to ally with LBGT community? You know, I will say that the vast majority of the people that I've encountered are exactly like the ones that you just described. Um, So groups uh, just like Minnesota Atheists, as well as um, American Atheists, the Freedom from Religion Foundation, the American Human Association, a lot of those groups have been doing this kind of work literally for decades, Um, some of them for longer than I have been alive. Um, And atheists overall definitely tend to be more progressive in their opinions about LGBTQ equality and other social issues than pretty much any other uh, religious group. So a lot of this work is already happening, um, and I absolutely want to recognize that. That said, in terms of opposition, so of course there's going to be some folks with fringe opinions in any group, um, and just like there are people from whatever group that don't support queer equality, I'm sure that applies to atheists as well. In terms of the opposition uh, that I encountered that was really deep held, it comes from the belief that atheism should be about not believing in God, not having a religious system, and it just ends there. That's the only thing we should care about, and there is nothing inherent to atheism um, that should have to do with collaboration or allyship or community building. Mm. Atheism starts and ends at the absence of belief in God. Um, I am arguing for us expanding our beliefs beyond that and saying, so maybe atheism starts with not believing in God, but maybe it continues to involve um, 
collaborating with other groups that have similar um, that have similar beliefs about the state of the world, that have similar beliefs about the separation of church and state, about realizing the sheer number of people who are both LGBTQ and atheist, or people of color and atheist, or immigrants and atheist, um, and really allying to support support our own people and support other groups because we have these shared principles. So I think um, the the opposition is not so much on the basis of um, opposition to LGBTQ rights, because I think that's just the where the majority of atheists fall right now, but it's rather what does it mean to be an atheist and what what should we do with our atheism, if anything. All right, and we're going to be heading into a break here again. So we'll return to our guest, Camille Barajak, after this short commercial break. Please stay with us. I'm Maddie Love in studio with Joseph Homrich, and you're listening to Atheist Talk on KTNF AM 950, the progressive voice of Minnesota. Thank you for tuning in to Atheist Talk on AM 950 KTNF. I'm your host, Maddie Love, in studio today with Joseph Homrich and on the phone with Camille Berjek, author of Queer Disbelief, Why LGBTQ Equality is an Atheist Issue. If you'd like to chat with us this morning, you can call us at 952-946-6205, email us at radio at mnatheist.org, or tweet us at Atheist Talk. Before we continue with this conversation, I want to thank our group of dedicated volunteers and the generous donations of you, our listeners. You help keep Atheist Talk on the air and in podcast form. If you're able to help with a donation, please consider doing so at our radio fun page or our Patreon, where you can get extended interviews at patreon.com slash Atheist Talk. Minnesota Atheist is a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. We couldn't do this show without you, and we deeply appreciate your support. Music for Atheist Talk is by composer and member Brent Michael David and is used with permission. Please note, all opinions are of guests and hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the Minnesota Atheist organization. Now, back to our conversation with Camille. So, Camille, going into the break, I was thinking... We were talking about stories and, and, and the voices in your book, and one of the stories that I thought was interesting – I mean, they were all they were all interesting, but the one that like really piqued my interest was on Joe. And Joe had just left the Jehovah's Witnesses, and he didn't want to align himself in a movement. Did you – did you see folks like Joe as still being allies, or like how did that conversation go? Like Joe still as allies, you know. I think that you you can only contribute to a movement so much as it doesn't take away from your own well being. Um, and for folks who have been really deeply hurt and wronged by their religious experiences and past, like who am I to say that you should be sacrificing a piece of yourself to support somebody else? Like that's of course not the ideal. And I wish that we could um, that we could be at a place where everyone can contribute to movements like these, but. If you're an ally, just in, you know, the way that you go about your life and how you treat and react to other people because your experiences preclude you from getting involved in any way um, that's more substantive at this moment, like, that's completely fine by me. You know, I'm not I'm not here to judge what everybody uh, is capable of contributing. Yeah, I saw that. And, and at first I was – at first, I, the first time I read through it, it was kind of like, I don't know, it somehow left a bad taste in my mouth. And then I went back and thought thought about it more. And realize, you know, he just got out of kind of a situation where he might have be having, going through like PTSD. I mean, yeah, some of these, like, absolutely, yeah. It's like I felt like I was like shaming him for. I mean, not to his face, obviously, but still. I mean, it's the same thought process that I was like shaming him for what he had gone through, and I just like, oh, that's not fair of me to do to him. Exactly. Yeah, I had that experience talking with a lot of um, a lot of folks as well. You know, it reminds me of when. Um, when people say in sort of broad sweeps, like, oh, it's okay to be gay now. Like, we've totally come around on LGBTQ issues. Everything is fine. It's definitely not what it used to be. Like, again, that speaks back to um, to the different identities people hold and the privileged ways they might experience the world that others don't. But also, you really never know what someone's background could be. You know, I came out to my parents in 2008, and it was generally fine, but someone else probably who I'll never meet came out to their parents the same year and got kicked out of their house. Like you really have no idea what somebody is going through. And so I don't think it's ever appropriate for us to say like this person should or should not be doing that. Um, or, or to speak about others experiences when we really don't know. Well, and that's kind of like, you know, going back to why the LGBTQ equality movement is an atheist issue. 
because you can come out to your parents as an atheist and get kicked out of your house. You can come out to your parents as gay, transgender, queer, whatever, and get kicked out of your house the same. Or, mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, and, and different different parents will like, oh, well, you're queer, but well, that's fine. You're an atheist, get out of here. Or vice exactly. versa, like, oh, you're an atheist, that's fine, but you're queer. Well, get out of here. Like they, it's they, they, they mirror each other so so closely. Yeah, they really do. And so many people, and um, a lot of the people that I spoke to said like, oh, I'm sure my parents would have been okay with it if it was just one or the other. But the fact that it was both, like, you know, sometimes in families, you see that um, as a rejection of how you thought your child was supposed to be or the child that you thought you were raising. And I'm, I'm not a parent, so I can't, you know, say what any of that is like. But um, in talking to some folks who are like, of course, when you have a kid, you have to let go of the idea that they're going to be the image that you have in your head. Um, but that's not that's not always easy for everybody, and to either reject uh, the religious belief that has been in the home for so long, or to be, you know, an LGBTQ kid that the parents weren't expecting. Um, that kind of thing can be can be really jarring to parents, but can have devastating consequences for the person who's come out. Uh, a, a funny story related. I, I am a parent. Um, my youngest is 23. He came mm-hmm. out to me probably about five, six years ago. And well, he first came out as transgender a long time ago, but he came out to me mm. about his faith about five or six years ago. And he's like, will you still love me if I'm a Christian? And I'm like, <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and, and I was kind of like, oh my gosh, like, did I fail as a parent that he doesn't know that I'm going to love him even as a Christian? And then I thought how hilarious it was that like, we're having the same discussion, but like in reverse as yeah. like some folks have to have, you know, to come out as an atheist. And I just, I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting, but it sounds like you, you did the right thing and uh, affirmed that you'll still love him. Well, yeah. Like how could you tell your kid, oh, I've, you know, that, 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 boggles my mind. I cannot wrap my head around that. But um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so my absolute favorite voice in your book uh, is that of Abby Stein, for probably obvious mm-hmm. reasons. Um, but we also had her as a guest here in Atheist Talk last year. Do oh, you... yeah? Awesome. Oh, Abby yeah, is... Abby's the best. I, I love Abby. <laughs> Do you have a favorite voice in this book? Or in lieu of picking a favorite, is there a voice that spoke to you personally louder than others? Uh, there were there were definitely a couple that were particularly striking. Um, so let me think. So uh, it, one of the very last interviews in the book is with Audrey White, who um, I have to say is a friend, but is also a phenomenal activist. Um, so they are they're a person who, when I think about what does progressive and inclusive religious practice look like. Audrey is just like an incredible example of that, of how to how to use faith as a vehicle for love and for justice and for doing right by other people. Um, when I first started this book, I was like, oh my gosh, I have to talk to Audrey because they are so smart and so good at um, and so good at speaking about these issues. So well, we had a really great conversation um, and I really uh, was grateful to be able to include their voice in here as well. Um, and there's there's a story that's towards the beginning of the book about a trans man uh, who is who's Catholic and who feels who feels compelled to be a priest. And there was a quote from him that when um, when we were talking and he explained this to me, it just blew my mind. So it's about how faith and identity are two things that are so deeply personal that even though you can't point to something in the world and say this is why I am the way that I am it's still so hugely significant. So this um, this gentleman told me that um, being trans is like being Christian to him in that if you took apart, in a, for, you know, for lack of a better word, if you looked at his chromosomes, you might not see him as a man based on just genetic makeup, but he, he knows that being a man brings him peace and joy and a sense of calm. And for the same reason, he can't point to why Catholicism is the right choice for him or is, you know, or is a uh, greater in his eyes than any other religious system, but he just objectively knows that that is what brings him that greatest sense of of peace and joy and calm. So that was one um particular particularly striking thing for me where it's like so what if other people don't see this? 
you know, so what if I can't explain why it makes me happy? I have the right to pursue the things um, that bring me the greatest sense of peace. And, like, I am absolutely not going to argue with that. Yeah, we had um, Jim Helton. I think he's at National Outreach Coordinator for American Atheists. We had him mm-hmm. and, and our state director in August Berkshire in studio a few weeks ago, and we were chatting with, like, we will happily march hand in hand with somebody of any faith based organization towards working on something that's towards equality, towards, you mm-hmm. know, these things that transcend. Like, we're not, gonna, we'll sit across from you in the debate of whether there's a God or not, sure. But when it comes to treating people with respect and treating people with dignity and, you know, values that we, that we hold dear, we don't care too much about if you're a Catholic or <laughs> if you're a Protestant or, or if an atheist. Absolutely. There's, and I think really that that's, sort of the atheist thing to do is to put aside the differences about what do you believe, what do you not believe, and look at, like, where can we do the greatest good? Um, Yeah, I think what you said about marching hand-in-hand with other folks like that is exactly right. And I did, I spoke to actually a lot of religious progressives who said that they had more in common with atheists than with evangelicals, because uh, those values of, like, social justice and doing right by others, they're so much more prominent in the way that they experience their faith, um, in the ways that they gather in their communities. And it's just, it's, it's baffling to me that there exists a subset of atheists who would cast aside working together with religious folks just because one believes in a god and one does not. And I, I, that's something that I've actually faced some criticism for, so that's definitely not an opinion that everyone has. Well, and to be honest, like when I first came out, um, when I was first leaving atheism, one of the reasons I that that led me to atheism and down the path of where I became an atheist was my sexuality and gender identity. And I remember being like really surprised at how many people love Jesus that are also hated by Pat Robertson. Like, yeah, <laughs> that's it's so true. It's so true. It it just caught me off guard because it wasn't the lens. Once again, I had been used to looking at the world through one lens and like this is what Christianity is and nothing else is Christianity. And then I left Christianity. It's like, oh, I had a very myopic view of the world. Yeah, it's it's so true. And like I'm I'm far from a religious scholar, but it's my understanding that when you boil down Christianity to or any other religion to this is exactly what it should be. It's like you're looking at a very small subset of the, you know, of the human population that can actually claim to be that kind of Christian. Um, yeah, it's, it's challenging to wrap your head around for sure. We have about a minute and a half before I have to go to break. Um, but I'm curious, we're talking about faith and all this other stuff, but do you run into folks who are surprised? They're, they're happy with the idea of a queer Catholic or a queer, queer Protestant or a queer Jew. But do you run into folks who are surprised at the idea of queer Muslims or that Islam can be queer friendly? Yes, definitely. Um, but being um, not being Muslim myself and only being able to speak to speak based on you know what queer Muslims have told me, I I want to like to defer to that experience and say if just like I said before, if that's something that brings you peace and joy and comfort, then um, then I'm not going to be the one to dictate uh, how others can experience can experience their faith. So it may be surprising to some um, to some folks that those two things can coexist, but I've seen it and I've spoken to people who um, who feel so empowered um, and at peace living in those uh, living at the at the intersection of those two things. So more power to them if that's the if that's the vehicle you use to bring more good into the world. Yeah, I feel like usually the biggest reason why people are surprised is because they have this view that all Muslims are evangelical, are of the equivalent to Pat Robertson, you know? Yeah. <laughs> that there, there, there can't be a moderate Muslim. <laughs> all right, we'll yeah. return to our guest, Camille Berejek, after this short commercial break. Please stay with us. I'm Maddie Love, in studio with Joseph Hombrich, and you're listening to Atheist Talk on KTNF AM 950, the progressive voice of Minnesota. Welcome back to AM 950, KTNF, the progressive voice of Minnesota. You're tuned into Atheist Talk. I'm your host, Maddie Love, in studio with Joseph Ombridge, and joined over the phone by Camille, Camille Barajek, author of <laughs> Queer Disbelief. I have butchered your name, like, the entire episode. I am so sorry. Um, it's really okay. It's a long name. 
As a reminder, if you're curious about Minnesota Atheists, you can check out the Minnesota Atheist website. We have previous episodes. You can browse book articles, book reviews, and peruse the calendar of upcoming events. You can also sign up for Atheist Weekly Email, which they just talked about in the last commercial. We always have a ton of activities going on around the Twin Cities and outlying suburbs. Come and discover all that Minnesota Atheists has to offer and consider becoming a member of Minnesota Atheists. Membership, membership has its perks. Check out how on the website. All right, I'm gonna. I wanted to get back and toss it back over to to Joseph because, like, he. I have tons of questions about like the nitty gritty content of this book, and I could talk to you, Camille, for like four hours. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to give Joseph a chance to talk to. Sure. So, so, Camille, I know people who have written books, and so the the obvious question is, wow, what motivated you to write a book, and where did you find the courage and the energy to put yourself out there and did you have a mentor in the form of a person or an organization that helped you along the way? Sure. So, um, so the book came out of my uh, my professional relationship with Hemant Metal, who I mentioned earlier is the editor of the Friendly Atheist blog. So, I'd been writing for him for several years and uh, had been exploring the different ways that queer folks and atheists support each other, and also the places where I thought that there were opportunities for collaboration uh, that maybe weren't uh, manifesting as robustly as they could have. So uh, after after writing for him for a few years, we decided that it was time to put so much of the research that I'd done um, into, into something that was a longer form, and it was right at the peak of the uh, 2016 presidential campaign. I actually started writing this when Obama was president and finished it after Trump had been elected. Uh, so if you see a, a shift from optimistic to pessimistic, that can sort of explain it. Um, but Hemet was absolutely an incredible mentor in putting all of this together. Um, he He's so passionate about the issue and so intelligent, knows so much about it. So he was just an incredible resource. Um, my wife is wonderfully supportive and was my cheerleader the entire time that I was putting it together. And in terms of finding the, the courage to put myself out there, I mean, I, that's something that I've been doing for a lot of my life. Um, I've wanted to be a writer since I was a little kid. Um, I've always loved writing like personal essays and doing storytelling and sort of using my experiences in the world to connect with other people and to, to find common ground um, and try to um, try to build community that way. So it was, it was scary in a way to open myself up um, to so many, to so many people in such a public way and say like, these are my feelings, my thoughts, my beliefs, um, take them or leave them. And this is my name right on it. But at the same time, um, I, I really drew a lot of strength from the people who I interviewed who said, like, yes, this is also a huge part of my life, um, and it's time that we talked about it more explicitly, more intentionally. Um, I, I felt like I was, I think I said earlier, it was really humbling to be able to um, to see myself as part of that incredible community and to, to create a final product that I'm really proud of. Well, thank you. And, you know, I want to thank you for your book because I think that stories are a very effective way of uh, communicating this and experiences and teaching uh, tolerance and acceptance. And I think it's just a, a wonderful idea. Um, and thank since you. you have an experience of being both an atheist and a member of the LBGTQ community, um, what would you want LGBT people to know about atheists that you think some of them don't? I would want them to know that, um, like I said earlier, not all atheists are the same. Um, we haven't all come to our atheism uh, in the same way. The, the paths that we take to settle on that identity are, are really different. For some people, it comes with a traumatic experience with faith that I don't think is something we should gloss over um, or minimize. And that, um, you know, I, I talk a lot about in the book about how there's these really persistent stereotypes that exist around what it means to be an atheist, but also about being a queer person. Um, and I think, you know, we have to look past what is what is the picture that we might get when someone says, oh, I'm an atheist, versus, like, what are that person's lived experiences? What makes them identify as an atheist? What are they passionate about? What do they care about? You know, what gets them out of bed in the morning? Um I think there's a there's a real danger in limiting our perceptions of people to one or two words and our associations with those. Um, and I would encourage LGBT people to 
to ask about <laughs> to ask about you know how people came to their atheist identity and and what it means to them because like you just said we can learn a lot by uh, by swapping stories. What about the opposite? Do you think um, did some of your atheist friends have have any misconceptions about the LGBTQ uh, community? Is there something that I mean I'm I'm an atheist and um, uh, I'm not a member of LGBTQ community. Is there something that I should be surprised to know? about that community that I probably don't? You know, I don't know about surprise to know, but I think it's really the same thing, that you can never know the the intricate details of somebody's story unless you ask. Um, and we all have such different experiences to bring to the table. You know, you can have 10 LGBTQ friends, and each of them came out at a different age, and all of their families reacted differently, and some of them, you know, think about their identity every single day, and some of them it's just, you know, it's, it's a footnote into the way that they live their lives. So I think it's actually really similar that you don't know, you don't know somebody's story unless you ask, and some of the best work can be done after we, after we intentionally get to know one another a little better. So we got another couple of minutes, and I want to talk about organizing and getting out there. Can you tell us about that? It's a sort of the final chapter in your book. Uh, For the benefit of our listeners, how do we organize? How do we get out there? How do we support each other? Advice you can give? Um, Sure. So uh, one of the biggest things, I think, is to um, to look for the folks who are already doing the work that matters to you. So some of the community organizers and activists that I spoke to uh, really wanted to drive this point home, that there's so much more power in, um, in gathering together with folks who have started doing this work than trying to reinvent the wheel every time. So if there's, you know, a local ordinance that's on the ballot in your area or, um, or a, a group that you think is, um, is harming others with their policies or if there's some kind of um, inclusivity bill that's, um, that's up in your, in your town, uh, find other people who care about it and then figure out together the way that you can uh, to communicate to as many people as possible why you're doing the work that you're doing. Um, and there's, there's some resources in the book for, um, for like groups to reach out to and things like that. But in general, like reach out to your local LGBT community center, look for uh, the atheist group that's organizing near you, um, find, find common ground. And when you, uh, when you build power with other folks in that way, you can get so much more done. Maddie, have we mentioned the complete title of the book? Yes, we have. Could we repeat it? <laughs> I, I will have to let no, I'm just kidding. It is Queer Disbelief, Why LGBTQ Equality is an Atheist Issue. And if you want to organize, you should totally organize Minnesota around Minnesota atheists. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Camille, Camille's book is also available on Amazon right now for the very low, low price of, I don't remember because I bought it two months ago. All right. <laughs> stick with us. Well, uh, stick with us not to the break, but over on our Patreon feed. Uh, thank you for tuning in to Atheist Talk. We'd love for you to join us again next Sunday, which should be another fantastic episode. This has been Atheist Talk on AM 950 KTNF, the progressive voice of Minnesota.